Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and the second of today's shows or another show, depending on where you are in the world with time differences. Uh, if you didn't see the one that was earlier, it was a fantastic personal journey with Peter Cox explaining his father's journey through um, Greece in 1941. That was really good. Lots of then and now photos. But anyway, today's return guest is Ellen Hampton, a journalist, historian and author who lives and works in France. She is back on World War II TV to talk about her new book, which covers the French doctors and the medical professionals and their work during the German occupation. And it's this book here i'm holding up a copy and there are links to purchase the book in the description below as there always are or you can find it at whatever bookstore you usually use so i'll bring ellen in so good evening Ellen. how are you today hi there fine thank you thank you for having me so we're we're talking about occupied france again which is a subject because obviously i live in france you live in france i i really like talking about and we were just talking about before going live about the ever changing way that the French occupation is viewed from from everybody was in the resistance to nobody was in the resistance that you know it gets referred to as the dark years and the, and you know you can't switch on the TV in France without it being talked about in at some angle so but yet for, as far as I'm concerned it doesn't seem that I've heard much about the medical aspect so how did you discover this angle in terms of the doctors and the medical professionals and, and what was important about bringing it to the, to, to a readership? Well, I think first we have to we have to say that in 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 years past the view of the occupation had been somewhat simplified. It was good and evil, good versus evil, black and white. And in more recent years, the complexity and the the grayness of everything yeah. has come forth. And that's that's the Jean Paul Sartre, Sartre quote that I use. That every choice that they had led them to evil. It was it was a really difficult time. And doctors were certainly at the center of that. Um, I became involved in this because I have done some work for the American Hospital of Paris. We did a film on their World War I role, which was tremendous. I mean, they, the hospital was just absolutely amazing in all the, the things they did during the First World War. So they wanted to move on and do a film on the Second World War. And we started working on that. And then the pandemic uh, occurred, <laughs> confinement. And that had to be put to the side. But I had already done a lot of research. So I just kept going and kind of went broader and brought in um, more of the French doctors because the American hospital's role was fairly minimal during the Second World War. Um, and it was interesting. And we were also in a moment when with the pandemic where there was a lot of conflict between the medical community and government in many countries. Mm. And so it seemed to me that it was there was a reflection of choices that doctors had to make under the occupation were happening again on a on a on a different level but still mm. um on a similar on a similar kind of level for um during the pandemic no that's a very good point and the fact that you know having read your book that the fact that as a medical professional you've taken some kind of oath to help people and we've talked about medics generally and and neutrality and treating the baddies and treating the goodies and treating civilians and, and it brings up the whole other aspect that you know, when we've talked about the French occup or the occupation of France before that, they, you know, we've talked about the fact we don't like the words resistance and collaboration. And I'm very much with um, the idea that it's kind of um, a defiance and accommodation are better words. But but as a, as a medical professional, as a doctor, you, you, you are duty bound to to help people. But you could still kind of decide who you help or where you are putting yourself so you can be of more use. So that's, that's the interesting angle there, but you've come armed with a PowerPoint, which I will bring up and you will tell me when to move on. And folks, we'll kind of do questions as we go along. Um, if, if we need to, or questions at the end, but it's interesting subject. I don't think you'll know very much about it um, because it's, it was new to me. And um, so there we are. So over to you, Ellen, to take us through this story. Okay. Well, it begins actually, um, with, with the, the 1930s wave of immigration, which comes from the East. The rise of fascism in the East sends people towards the West, they stop in France. This sparks, combined with the blowback from the worldwide depression, it sparks a, a big wave of anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, and people are getting caught in that, particularly Jews, okay? Now, the figures show that about the immigration of the late 1930s, counted about 200,000 Jews compared to 2 million Italians, Spanish, uh, and Poles who were also immigrating over. Um, so it's a, it's a small minority, but the propaganda and all the fake news campaigns 
makes it seem like the Jews are a huge threat. There was an article that said um, that uh, Jewish physicians made up 35% of practitioners in the Paris region in 1936. In 1938, the um, Paris government finally took a census and found that in fact, they made up 2% of the practicing physicians. So this was all a lot of propaganda aimed at blocking people who had come from elsewhere from working. So then the war occurs, right? And people tend to think that the Nazis arrived and put in their program, and that's what happened to the Jews in France. This was going on before. There was the rise of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. that was very strong. Um, so J France falls in June of 1940. In July, the, the, um, the new Vichy government under Marshal Pétain uh, passes a rule that if your father wasn't French, you can't practice medicine. Then in August, there's another one. Um, more, more professions are, are getting blocked. In October, they start with the Statute des Juifs, which defines who is Jewish and who is not. Um, you can flip forward on, on yeah. some of this because I've got the... Uh, so th this is just a map because people may not realize, I know that your subscribers do, but there may be... They're a pretty good bunch. Yeah, they're they're, they're well-trained now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, so this, uh, this is how France was split in June of 1940 um, with Vichy in the unoccupied zone, but the government was not acting independently. Um, they, the Germans would set the agenda and Vichy would carry it out and they didn't have very much room to move. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll give them that much and then, then we'll move on because then they are, they are um, behind, this is French. This is not the Germans, but these um, these are examples of how the press was considering these issues. First, in 1938, you have a thing about um, immigrants and how terrible they are. Then, Au Pilori, which to the pillory is the name of the, the newspaper. It was um, probably the worst of the occupation newspapers, the most vicious, the most relentless against British. OK, don't forget, they were totally against the Brits. Um, Jews, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, you name it. They, you know, they were just Freemasons. That was their other big enemy. Um, so they were writing articles and they attacked the medical profession as well. They considered that, um, that Jewish doctors should not be able to practice at all. So the government comes out with a, a, a quota system for, okay, first, sorry, let me back up. First, they're not allowed Jewish doctors are not allowed to practice in public hospitals. So that's that's one of the main jobs that doctors did at the time was in the hospital work. Um, then they set a quota for private practice where in every department in France, only 2% of practicing physicians could be Jewish. So that is obviously putting, a, 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 you know, making a very tense and difficult situation. So doctors who are not Jewish are also having to ask themselves, wait, what? You know, I mean, how are they supposed to do this? You know, this is, this is, uh, this is against everything they've been taught. And at the same time, the government is saying, you can't treat terrorists and terrorists are anybody who's against the Vichy regime or the Nazis. You know how this goes. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think one of the important things about this today is that we see um, some similar measures, not obviously to, this, to the extent of during the occupation, but there are measures being taken around the world that um, echo the first steps of the, the occupation that leads to deportation and then to the Shoah. In, in 1940 and 41, people didn't see that coming. They didn't know that's where that was that's where that was going. But but how did it get there? This is how you start with a lot of lies and you repeat them and you pick an enemy and you attack relentlessly. So it's I think it's important to pay attention to what happened in the past in order to pay attention to what's no, definitely. Happened. I mean, I, I'm thinking of all these these echo modern echoes and 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 you know, we know about the religious and, and racial elements that the, the Nazis and indeed that was going on in Europe generally, but this this general suspicion of people who are clever as doctors are people who have qualifications, people who are academically um, successful, the, the the working people are told to be suspicious of those people. And and that that has lots of echoes of what's going on today. This this fear of of 
of of of science, fear of of people who are, who who know what they're talking about. So, I think everybody watching this is thinking, oh, there's there's so many there's so many levels to this, but there we will are. try and keep it and, with the past. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, on the, on to the next slide, you have the uh, the document that that people had to fill out if they were if they could be considered Jewish, and the the standards for that under the Statute des Juifs. Uh, three Jewish grandparents or two Jewish grandparents and a um, Jewish spouse. And then they would have an identity card that was stamped Jew. Uh, and so the idea, most people were trying to avoid that. And I talk about one particular couple. You can switch the slide. Um, it's uh, Robert. Oh, I forgot about this. Okay, never mind. <laughs> let, me, let me back up. Um, when all this is happening, a group of very prominent, because it starts aiming at foreigners, you know, then it moves to the French Jews. And a group of very prominent uh, French Jews wrote a letter to Marshal Pétain and said, listen, we are against all of this and you can't consider us not French. And this was part of, of the letter that they wrote. Um, this is a picture by Robert uh, Doineau that is my favorite picture of the occupation period altogether because I think it just sums up France. It's very you French, know. isn't it? Yeah, it's, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's just a fabulous photograph. Um, okay, so the, one of the men who signed the letter was Dr. Robert Debray. There, we go. there you go. He was a pioneering um, pediatrician. Um, he becomes very important post-war uh, because of his work on health policy. He was also one of the founders of UNICEF. He, he's everywhere. Anyway, during the occupation, um, he is the son of the chief rabbi of Neuilly-sur-Seine, uh, which is a sort of a posh suburb of, of Paris. Um, and he, when he was a teenager, he wrote a memoir uh, that explains that when he was a teenager, he weighed science against religion and chose science and he left behind religion altogether. He did not consider himself to be a Jew. The Nazis and Vichy did. So they fired him, they got him and he couldn't do this, he couldn't do that. And he and he kept a journal, which his um, family was kind enough to share with me. And he wrote in it, um, appalled to keep getting stuck in this situation, nauseated to, to, to feel that this Jewish problem keeps coming up. Um, he was he was very disturbed. So he and his romantic partner, Doctor, um, excuse me, she's not a doctor. <laughs> One of the few non doctors in the book, Elisabeth de la Bourdonnais. She is a forty two year old countess, mother of six, and she left her husband for Doctor Debray. Uh, he was the pediatrician for for her children, and they were wondering what can we do. That, that's what they get. They met some of the um, people from the Musée de l'Homme network. They heard that they were sort of organizing. They had friends. And so they put themselves forward as what can we do? How can we help? And that network, which was one of the earliest, I'm sure you're familiar with it. Um, they said, can you write up broadsheets that tell the truth about the situation and just leave them in public places? So Elizabeth, who was already working for him as a typist, a secretary, she did the typing. And they they wrote about the situation. Keep in mind that while this is obviously before social media, it's also before television. Mm -hmm. So most of the information people are getting are coming from the press, which is entirely pro Vichy, pro Nazi or clandestine. Those are the two. You don't have anything in the middle. Uh, so um, they started doing that, helping. Um, she offered her apartment for people to, to stay in if they needed to her chateau, if anyone needed to sneak across the Spanish border. Um, and uh, they're involved in this. And like so many other groups, it was infiltrated. And the Gestapo arrested 19 members of the, um, of the group in early 1941. Among them was Elizabeth de la Bourdonnais. So Debray is really upset. And, and in his journal, he talks about how terrified he was for her um how how difficult the situation was she finally gets paroled and um and and uh, the trial is held the following january and she was released on time served but seven men of the group were shot at mont valerian they were executed for their role so at that point, they really knew how dangerous things were getting. It wasn't, there was no more a sense of, well, we're just gonna do what we want. 
and you know to hell with the consequences no they knew they knew that if they were targeted watched and they risked everything mm -hmm. So I'm going to interrupt there for two reasons. One is people in a sidebar are asking me to say rabbit hole because it's St. Patrick's Day. They want to start drinking. So I'm going to say rabbit hole so everyone can have a drink. <laughs> well, Thanks I hope it's for choosing here. a really appropriate here, time. Okay? <laughs> yeah, an appropriate time about someone being in prison. But whatever, we've got that out of the way. The second point, the more serious point I want to make is we're always talking on this channel about what is resistance. And, and again, when we think about it, people think resistance means going out and stabbing people or blowing up trains or doing it. In this, in this case, it is about recording what's happening, letting other people be aware of, of, of the situation, what's changing, how the regulations are in, encroaching on, the, on daily life. And it's it's not the aspect of resistance that we kind of think about. It doesn't make comic books, but it does make for a really interesting examination of what um, defying a, a regime that you stand against can be. It can it can be, from an academic point of view, of as I say, of, of recording recording it for posterity. So it's a, it, it's allowing people to challenge their notions of what resistance is. So thank you. Absolutely. No, and, and it was an information war in the, in the early, in 1940 and 41, it's an information war. And who has the upper hand on information? I mean, there's also a parallel with what's going on in Russia today, mm. where they're getting no information other than what they're told by the government. And it, it's really, it's really difficult for them, people who are inside Russia to to understand why things are the way they are because they're not getting the whole story. Same for France um, in you know different circumstances obviously but the same uh, informational problem yeah. for France. I'm, I'm going to show you a news sheet in a bit uh, on the French doctor news sheet that's on a slide coming up. Um, so the, the next one is these three figures so um, right so these are these are some of the doctors uh, who also then okay so they're all friends and they would not associate with people they didn't really know and trust at this point. They're being very careful. Uh, Dr. Louis Pasteur, Valérie Radeau, is the grandson of the great scientist Louis Pasteur. And he's completely eccentric. And he runs around Paris saying, oh, the Germans are going to be gone soon. Don't worry. And getting in all kinds of trouble. But he's so prominent that they don't touch him yet. Paul Milliez is his assistant who tries to keep him out of, uh, out of trouble. Uh, Valerie, well, they called him PVR. You can understand why it's a little long to say his whole name. PVR's wife said, oh, they're like um, uh, uh, Sancho, Sancho, oh, what's his name? God, I just forgot it. Don Quixote and, and, and Sancho, Panza. Don Sancho, yeah. Sancho Panza, right. Exactly. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Dr. Robert Merle Daubigny was another part of the group. Um, and he has a very interesting, uh, he has a Jewish wife. She's a Russian Jew, but She's immigrated to France and and he has to somehow get a card for her that doesn't say Jewish. And he goes through this whole rigmarole with uh, with a, a very um, pro Nazi doctor who's in charge of that. Um, Dr. George Montandon, who um, he he was he wrote a, a lot and his articles are just appalling. I mean, it's just you read them and you think the worst that you could of this person who's writing. So somebody accused him of following Hitler's ideology and Montandon replied, no, Hitler is following mine. You know, that he, he was, yeah, no, he was really a sick man and he um, met his end in uh, August of 44. So um, move on. There's there. Okay, so Elizabeth in, it was in this prison. This is the old Cherche Midi prison. It's been torn down now. Uh, in fact, now the École d'Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales is there, which is highly ironic. But um, And she becomes, as soon as she's out of jail, she goes right back to helping. They are, she and Robert Debray are taking um, taking in Jewish children. They have a, they have a link to the Hôpital Rothschild, which I talk about in the book. Um, they get um, Jewish children and they they put them in new clothes and they send them with a nurse to the Loire Valley to live with uh, farm families. And Debray wrote in his thing, we told them they were Flemish refugees. We don't think anyone believed us, but there was never a denunciation. So that, that worked out really well. They did a lot of fake documents, um, medical certificates for people trying to avoid the obligatory work service mm -hmm. or, you know, saying someone had tuberculosis when they didn't or 
um, anything they could do on a medical plan. So all those three doctors, plus Debray and uh, some others, got together and formed a thing called the Resistance Health Service in 1942. And they used their medical expertise and their social authority and their ability to move around because they had laissez passes when yeah. other people didn't because they were doctors, right? Um, so they, they used what they could to help uh, people who were resist resistance were getting injured and they couldn't go to the hospital. So they became kind of, you know, this, this worked out for them. And, and uh, that was the center of their work for that time. Mm, brilliant yeah. stuff. Uh, this is a picture of the Rue de Rivoli. You'll recognize it uh, during the occupation. Um, it, it's kind of heartbreaking to see. And we were talking there. before going live about the, the new, the new, fairly recently redone Musée de la Libération in Paris and how well it is and how many photos there are in this museum of Paris under occupation that I realized you do see them occasionally, but they don't. They, they don't seem to circulate in the way the photos of the liberation in August 44 do, or the, 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 they do for obvious reasons. But, yeah. you know, the Paris was fully, fully, you know, Third Reich. Uh, the, the, everything, cinema entrances, metro, everything was, was bilingual and, and swastikas everywhere. And it, it's, it's, it, you've kind of, you think, I think we think of the war films a lot of kind of rural France, maybe not having Germans in every, every area but the middle of paris was you know it was everywhere well what, what's kind of interesting is when you look at the geography of the occupation um the germans came in and they came from the east so they started occupying the east they soon abandoned it and moved to the west the um 16th arrondissement and the west of paris from neuilly to saint germain en laye saint germain en laye was the most occupied town in france that's where they had the command uh, the western command post Whose yep. German name I can't pronounce and won't try. Ob West is what we call Ob it. West, for yeah. sure. Okay, double. So that was yeah. in, in Saint Germain en Laye. Do you know Saint Germain en Laye, Paul? A little bit, but not not well. Because there's 20 bunkers still there that they built. And they're and what's fun, I did an article about this for Military History magazine. Um, the bunkers are there, but they're not labeled. <laughs> well, some of them are casemates, casemates, mm -hmm. um, where they uh they were just street checking kind of things. But there are there's a there's a major bunker right next to the chateau in Saint Germain, uh, okay. with no label on it at all. <laughs> they weren't able to destroy it because it would have um, destroyed the castle, so they had to leave it. And the mayor and I have discussed this, and he's like, "I'm not going to advertise Nazi stuff." And I'm like, "Okay, fine, but <laughs> it's part of history." <laughs> anyway, we'll see. So um, ge geographically, the, the occupation moves from east to west, and uh, it's kind of interesting, the numbers, uh, they were in the, in the western part of Paris more than anywhere. Yeah, Yeah. no, definitely. So 41 and the, the Jew in France is getting, yeah, it, it's, it's building, getting worse. Yeah, this was an exhibit put on by the Institute for the Study of Jewish Questions and the, Jew uh, the German Propaganda Office. Um, which was very busy during these years. And they basically looked at different um, aspects of different professions and how, uh, I mean, their idea is, is that Jews damaged everything. So this is the medical part of it. And they put the pictures of 13 Jewish doctors up there and wrote quackery, charlatanism, you know. Um, and then they repeated the lies about the numbers. You can see them on there that there were, you know, they just, it's the double, it's double what the actual numbers were. And they knew the actual numbers. So there, this is deliberate propaganda aimed at persecution. So a lot of people went to this, um, among them, uh, Louis Ferdinand de Touche, who's better known as Céline, the author. And he was uh, annoyed with the organizers because they didn't sell his work there. And he had written several pamphlets urging the Vichy government to be tougher on Jews. So he was a, a vicious anti-Semite and he ended up having to flee the country and he, he did some jail time. Um, but it, it's, it's sad because he's one of France's great writers. He really is. He was very innovative and everything, but he has this side. And, and to me, that that is such an um, example of the occupation where you have, it, it's just not simple at all. Here's this brilliant man and he's totally evil on the other side. So what do you, you know, what do you do? Anyway. As you said there, the nuance is we are finally in an era where we're accepting the nuance. We're expecting that 
and people who are around in France that time, they aren't necessarily, you can't paint them with one brush because how they stood in 1940 was maybe different to how they've stood in 42 and again in 44, 45. You know, we are all, I suppose, uh, allowed to change our minds. We're allowed to, to revisit our ideology. But so some of these people, they're very hard to put in a box because they change boxes. Uh, so it's uh, it really is endlessly, endlessly nuanced. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. But moving um, on to the to the to the yeah. So this was an example of a broadsheet that um, they started, and it was two doctors, Dr. Uh, Maurice Tenin and Jean Claude Bauer, started this in uh, when the first issue. What is that? 1941, I think. Um, and it's called the French Doctor, and it basically explains what they're doing and why they're doing it. Uh, and you have the quote there. I'm not going to read it for you. Um, by the time this came out, uh, Tenin had been shot and Jean-Claude Bauer was arrested and shot shortly afterwards. So, so this may seem like a very simple and small act, but it cost them their lives just to try to tell the truth. So that's, it's important to, to make a point of that, I think. Yeah, we definitely. forget. Yeah. So here's a group that was founded by doctors, um, a, a resistance group called Vengeance. It would be theirs. And Dr. Victor Dupont in the middle with the raincoat, and next to him is Dr. Francois Vetterval, um, and along with Dr. Raymond Chanel, who is not in that picture. Uh, they began one of the largest resistance networks um, in during the occupation, and they started a sabotage wing and, a, and an infiltration wing and an intelligence wing, and all three of the founders ended up arrested by the Gestapo and deported. The interrogator for Dupont said, you played, you lost, now you pay. Wow. Well, he went to Buchenwald. Um, and so I, I did a chapter in the book about Buchenwald because there were about 80 French doctors who ended up there. Yeah. And how they dealt with being doctors. And this, this is entirely separate from the issue of Nazi doctors doing sordid experiments on patients. It has nothing to do with that. This is doctor prisoners trying to keep their fellow prisoners alive with no supplies, no help, nothing. But if they were able to get someone in the clinic, there were clinics and there were two clinics in uh, Mukenbaum. Um, they might be able to save them just by giving them a little bed rest, you know, maybe a little extra food. Uh, conditions were dire, you know, it, it was terrible. So, um, so that's, that's part of what I wanted to look at. And it's important also to, when you talk about deportation, historians have tended to separate the deportation of Jews to the death camps, like Auschwitz, yeah. from resistance, people who were deported for resistance activities. And the numbers are, are not that far apart. About 76,000 Jews were deported from France and about 86,000 resistance. The difference is in the return rate because only 5% of the Jews returned, survived it and came back. And for the resistance, the figure is 60%. So you can see the difference in the camps, the treatment, the everything happened. Uh, and right that's there. resistance so, under all the umbrellas of how we use the word. That is the blowing up trains resistance to the people who are uh, politically resistant. Is that is that true? Is that fair? Yes, it's, well, it's people who were, who were arrested for resistance activity. Did they actually do it? Were they really guilty? We don't have any idea, but yep, they were yeah, yeah. arrested, charged uh, under the court. banner of under the modern, you know, the, would be yeah. the kind of the terrorism act, would it? That the, right. all encompassing your anti anti your anti establishment, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I want to ask you, Ellen, because it's going to come up about the the Hippocratic Oath and 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 doctors, because there's all these stories. I mean, they're in your book and they're in other other works. You like, for example, when Mag Mother Half did the show about the Jews in Normandy, the doctor in Cherbourg who who made up a pretend pretend disease to keep the Germans away from some people. Right. Um, and that, that happened in Italy somewhere else where the, 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 the doctors invented something and said to the Germans, it's highly contagious, you can't come in here. Now, you're saving lives with that method, but you're, you're cheating, you're, 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 you're not acting, well, you are acting professionally. So how, did, did these academic doctors, did they have questions about what they what was a correct morally, given that they have signed this oath, given that they are doctors, or did they just think anything goes, it's war? 
Um, I think everyone made their own decision on that. They weighed the consequences, they weighed the, the, the situation, and they decided which side they were on. Um, there, you know, there, the large majority of the French during the occupation did not take a side. They just kept their head down. The, there were about 300,000 resistance, about 100,000 active collaborators, and then everybody else is in the middle. Um, so these doctors who made the decision to resist and to do everything they could to undermine the Nazi program and the Vichy compliance with it, um, it was a personal decision. But, you know, the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. Uh, and the government was asking them to do harm. The other thing the doctors got really annoyed by was the, um, the government said they had to turn in any terrorists that they found had a gunshot wound or were treated. And if they did that, then the person would be arrested and probably shot. So the Hippocratic Oath could be interpreted that by doing no harm, they would lie about it. And also, so secrecy in medicine is huge in France, right? You cannot, the doctor cannot tell you anything about any patient's condition. It's, it's against the rules. And the government was asking them to go against that rule. And that's the foundation of medicine for them. So they were absolutely not going to tell the government anything at all about their patients. It was just not on. Um, but I think it was a very personal decision. And, and some people, like you said, just a few minutes ago, it took them a while to get there. But they did by the end, you know. Um, Paul Millier yeah, said he went into it. It's always a thing with, with France is that you, you, if, every, if everyone at the beginning had seen how it was going to be towards the end, they would have thought differently about it. But they, they things were cranked up. It, well, you couldn't see, you couldn't see the, the extent. You would, no one would believe it. I mean, I think that's the thing. I think we, we are, we're, so, we now understand that the full horror, horrors of Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Sobibor and, and all that Dachau. But at the beginning, it's hard to for anybody to predict it. It had got that bad. A few people knew, knew right at the beginning, but you know, your average person in an occupied country in France or Denmark could have never imagined just how awful it was. Um, but we, you know, we're going down a potential discussion that is complicated. But we're going to move on now to, to the to the, the doctors who are working oh, actively with the Mackie and the and the resistance around, around France. So, um, so back to you. Exactly. So because of the obligatory um, work service, they were deporting, uh, not deporting, they were sending um, all men between 18 and 50 had to go work in Germany. Um, there were some exceptions, but, you know, anyone who didn't want to do that, which was a lot of people, uh, went into hiding in the in the bush and they called them the Maquis. And uh, you probably are familiar with all this. Um, so I looked at the Maquis in the Morvan. The Morvan is in Burgundy. It's a plateau. It's a forest. Um, the advantage of the Morvan was there was no train track crossing it and no major highway or road crossing it. So it was small roads, forest, a um, lot of farms, very, very big farming area. Um, and a bunch, uh, there were three to 5,000 Maquis in Maquisards in the Morvan in, uh, in June of 1944. This is ramping up as they see, well, April, May of 44. And then in June, once the, the D-Day invasion happens, everybody joins the Maquis <laughs> to try to help because they, they needed them. Their main role at that point was to block the Germans who were trying to evacuate um, towards the east uh, they're a little bit, they're, they're west of Dijon, they're in there, okay, so, so you've got um, German troop movements, uh, their job is to break that up, they get hurt, they get injured, they set up a clinic, this is Dr. Alec Prochian, who wrote a wonderful memoir um, of his time in the Maquis, um, the first, wa now the watercolors were done by uh, one of the Maquisards, and they're just wonderful, there's a whole series of them, the first one is the, the chateau where they put the first hospital, and they, the Germans found it and attacked and, and almost killed people. Um, the second is a sketch of uh, some of the medical personnel who were just volunteers, basically. There was Alec Procyon was a, a med student who'd finished it. He was doing his residency by then. And his fiance, who was an anesthesiologist. And they end up operating in the forest under parachute tents because, well, I'll get to that in a second. And they used... Um, they use car batteries to attach to headlights to, to get some light because they're in the middle of nowhere. They have nothing. 
But what they did have was they had the SAS and they had a lot of parachuted goods coming in from uh, from the Americans and the British, like 70 million francs a month being parachuted in cash, jeeps, heavy artillery, all sorts of things are being boom, parachuted in that potato field. They had their whole they had their whole system set up. And one of the SAS guys wrote a great memoir. His name is Ian Wellstead. Um, and he he explains how it was in in that summer in the Morvan. So it's it's a it's an interesting side sort of look at what happened. Mm, uh, and it and it brings in that whole connection of of the Allied support for the resistance and 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 motivation. If you're whether whether you're in the Morvan or you're down in the Vercors or something, if you're going out actively uh, fighting against the occupation, you it's good to know there are doctors around who will try and patch you up if you if you get 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 wounded it's it's just it's better for your morale it's just, so it's and i don't think we think of we don't think about the resistance as having that kind of structure we think of the resistance very from the movies very not disorganized but kind of gangs of surly guys with stubble and berets living in caves and of course it is actually at various points much more organized than that with much more as you say support from the from 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 britain and and and, and superstructure infrastructure which is is, is worth worth noting mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, moving on. Okay. So the question was, uh, were there any Americans who were involved? And, you know, most Americans left uh, France by the autumn of 41 because it seemed clear that uh, the U.S. was going to enter the war, which they did in December of 41. But the Americans had seen what happened to the Brits who got caught, the British, excuse me, who got caught in uh, in France. And they were interned in camps that were nothing like the concentration camps in Germany, but they were not fun. They were not a, a place you wanted to be. So they left the country when they could. The American hospital continued to operate under the occupation. And here you have a picture of Sumner Jackson. He was American and he's married to Charlotte, who was Swiss born, French raised. She didn't want to leave. So they stayed um, and he became the chief medical officer during the occupation. Um, they both ended up joining the resistance and uh, helping um, helping where they could. They ended up they kept a, an American aviator who fell and uh, who parachuted in and was hidden um, and uh, did various other things their network gets infiltrated as well and they end up deported in may i mean charlotte was deported 10 days before paris was liberated and you know it's another year before the allies get to germany and liberate the camp so it's really just heartbreaking their story um sumner and their son philip who was sort of a teenager he was about 16 they were sent to newingam and charlotte was sent to Ravensbrück. And unfortunately, um, the, there's this terrible friendly fire error that happens. Uh, Newingam was evacuated in late April, early May of 45. And the prisoners were sent to Lubeck Bay and put on ships. Um, the British Air Force didn't get the word that those weren't escaping Nazis. They thought they were escaping Nazis. And um, they were prisoners from the, the concentration camps. And they bombed the ships. And about 7,000 men died in, in that bombing. Philip, however, escaped. You can switch the slide because then we see Philip. Um, there we go. Yeah, he escaped. He, he jumped off of his ship and swam to shore and went to work for the British Army as an interpreter because he'd been raised in France. He was bilingual. Um, and then Charlotte did return from Ravensbrook. Um, she survived. But Sumner was never seen again. It's very sad. Um, he he really uh, was a hero in in many ways in just staying for one and in doing his job and then staying. He stayed in Lubeck to help the prisoners who were ill. He could have left and he didn't. So, so that's um, part of the American involvement there. And, yeah, and then um, so there's a, the liberation of Paris, which is uh, such a fine time. And, you know, you mentioned the, the new museum, the new museum. I keep saying new. It's been there a few years now. <laughs> um, it feels uh, the, new, though. New, Newish location, though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it just feels so new because it, it just is so lovely and so well designed and the, and the approach is new. So I, I keep saying that. Yeah. 
and as, as you were saying earlier, they have this virtual reality um, thing in the, in the basement where you can be part of the liberation practically. Yeah, no, folks, we're talking about the, the, the image. I'll put a link in the description later on, but you can go and visit the, but the underground bunker that was used by the, the, the resistance it, it, during the fighting for the, for the city. And, and you, you're a journalist visiting wearing a headset and you get to meet the colonel and you get to meet the, 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 the secretaries and the telegraphists. And then you have to do a little game. You have to build a barricade. You have to build a barricade with trees and sandbags and things. And they explain you what it does. And it's, it, you know, me and me, Colin and Matt went into it a bit kind of we're middle-aged guys. Is this us? Is this, I mean, we're not teenagers and we, we bought into the whole concept very, very quick. And it's, it's a really good museum. If you haven't been to, if you're going to Paris and you think about it as a stop off to go to Normandy or somewhere else, there is, there is historical stuff to do in the city and it is worth, it's, it's in near in Montparnasse. It's, it's worth, worth seeing. And there's a good curry house just down the road I found as well. But, um, <laughs> that's another story, but um, back to you, Ellen. Yeah. Well, that's it. That's it. Basically, that's the liberation of Paris. I, I do a chapter about that because it was just such an exciting time. And and um, and then there's a monument at the Ecole de Médecine in Paris for uh, doctors who were killed in the war. A lot of it is military service, military doctors who, who were killed in their service. And then it, it does include doctors who were killed in deportation or who died in deportation. Mm. So that's an interesting, um, interesting thing. Other than that, um, there's not much about doctors specifically i mean i i was looking at doctors i think a period like the occupation is so huge and so full of different things that it's hard to get a grasp of and if you look at a specific group then you can you can see what happened to those specific people because of who they were and tell the story through them and it's much more accessible so that's that's another reason no, why I, I agree and it and, and being defined by their profession you know the 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 Jap you talked about right at the beginning, who didn't even consider himself Jewish. He was he defined himself by his his love of science and medicine, but by the occupiers was considered something else. And we're back to that modern idea of labels and the label you give yourself, different to the label that people give me. And I I always talk when I'm moving around, I'm I'm both English and British and European and a world citizen. And at various points of, I will use different ones for different reasons. And I'm, a, I'm an Essex boy as well from, from a particular part of England. So the labels we use are very important until someone tells you you're something that you hadn't considered yourself as. And then suddenly it, it becomes very complicated. But I want to bring up a question that's quite a heavy one, really. But I, I wasn't going to. But then I thought, you know, what the hell with it now? So Gregory is asking. Uh, did Anne Hampton come across examples of French medical professionals who subscribed to the eugenics um, movement? Indeed, indeed. Um, the, probably the best example is Alexis uh, Carrel. Uh, Alexis Carrel was uh, really important in the First World War. He was a, he'd won the Nobel Prize for discovering how to uh, do surgery on nerves, and he's and he helped develop the first antiseptic. He, he that fought gas gangrene. He was. He was brilliant, he was wonderful, and he fell off the shelf. And he became, uh, he started a thing called the Institute for, oh God, um, something about human problems. I forget the exact name of it, but it basically was a study of eugenics. He thought the Nazis had some very good ideas about eugenics and that the human race was becoming so weak and so it was going downhill. Um, and so, yes, he was very much involved in uh, in helping the Vichy government, and he pretty much agreed with the Nazis. So before he could be prosecuted, he died of a heart attack in uh, November of 44, I think it was. Uh, so he's he's a very good example of that. Yeah. And it's, it's a fascinating question. Again, it brings up this nuance of, of, of the overlaps of people. People can be in more than one category. I mean, Asperger's, there's all that recent thing about Hans Asperger, the Austrian being into eugenics and awful, awful stuff as well. So the, a name we use, you know, the Asperger's, there's there's weird right. weird history to that as well. So it's the, the, the more you study the past, the more you realize putting people in any one category and hoping they're going to sit in that one category is is always problematic in that there's these overlaps with other areas and it, and it makes it endlessly fascinating so you've you present this idea of the doctor do you have any idea the num obviously there's the, the there are doctors serving within the military you, know, you wrote about the Rochelle Bell and talked about that last time so there are the French second army division there be med, uh, doctors within that and there are French doctors in the serving in the air forces but have you any idea across the country how many 
medical professionals were involved in some kind of aspect form of resistance or is it too 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 impossible to get to ascertain i i i don't have a specific number um i made a list of doctors who uh were deported or arrested and i came up with about 350 but it you know it, it's just random it, yeah. it's who i've come across so yeah, again, I would say several, and again, it changes. Like Paul Milliez wrote in his memoir that uh, he went into the health ministry. He and PBR were named to the health ministry um, when Paris was liberated. And he found letters from doctors denouncing other doctors for being anti-Vichy, anti-everything. Um, and some of those doctors had changed sides since mm. then. He burned all those letters wisely mm. because he said, this is going to be fodder for blackmail and I'm not doing it. So wow. let's just start a new, De Gaulle said at the end, you know, we have to know how to forget, which is part, part of the reason um, the, the history of the occupation doesn't really start to get told until Robert Paxton in 1972. But that's another story. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it is endlessly um, di discussable the, uh, the the occupation, the whole system. You know, and, and both of us living in France, it's it, there's always a new wave of how it's being looked at, and it's it's endlessly fascinating. And 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 the changes are, are clear now. We now have this historiography of how it was talked about in the fifties, and the sixties, and the seventies, and eighties, and and all those figures who, who loom large in French politics, and Mitterrand, and others, and they all have a place somewhere in how and Macron himself has a place in how the, the war has been remembered about whether you do say something to commemorate something, whether you don't say something, whether you do meet Germans who visit or don't meet or whether you do mention things, it's it's still it's still really important to French to French people. But um we will bring things to an end. There was one more question I was going to ask, but I've forgotten what it was now. It was something mm -hmm. uh, but I've completely forgotten what it was. But um it, it oh I know what I was gonna say I'm sure there are many thousands of doctors who were just putting their profession first so so if a, if a wounded german soldier came in from an allied bombing they would treat him if a french civilian came in who needed treatment they would treat them and then later on uh, a resistance work a fighter who was being was wounded in the combat was brought in they would treat them and, and just just stick to that uh, that that oath which which is a which i suppose is it's a it's a perfect response, isn't it? So I'm just I'm I'm here to, to save lives. I'm here to do my job. And I suppose if you if you stick to that, you can come out of the war fairly um fairly you know confident that you 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 made a good choice. Well, sure, but I mean the problem was if they treated a uh, a resistant, they'd then be arrested and shot or deported. And yeah. what happens to their family? You know they had. It wasn't just them; it was their families yeah, and, and their living. Do they stop participating in the government because they disagree with it? How do they eat? There's no food anyway. You know, I mean, the rationing thing was just horrific. Well, that that's so, another. So you know, the we choices whole, were were very difficult. And, we could do and a whole so show. Bravo to the people who really stood up and and did the right thing uh, at sacrifice. Uh, sacrifice. Uh, yeah, a lot of people were killed. In, they definitely made the, the ultimate sacrifice, but then some others um, had more resources mm. than others. So. And there's a discussion just that, yeah, that the, 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 the abject hunger in Paris prior to liberation. Mm. I mean, that, that's something I don't think I was aware of till I was reading I Michael either. Nyberg's works and Matthew Cobb's work, you know, that it seemed to have been overlooked that aspect and, 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 and the, the movement of the French, troops into Paris was as much as anything else a human, humanitarian act because they, you know, the, the prisons were, they'd eaten the cats and I'm not, I'm not joking folks. They had eaten the cats. They were, yeah, it was getting really bad. And yeah. although it was never a military objective, it, it became an imperative to save lives. And the, the, anyway, it's a fascinating sense, but where are you going next with your research? What's, what's next for you in, 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 in your kind of unique viewpoint of an American transplanted to a France, mm -hmm. French family, French, what's next for bring, bringing all this out, these uh, parts of history together? Well, I, I'm not um, I'm not working on anything specific right now. I ha I want to do a series on um, medieval. Sorry, it's not your subject. Mm -hmm. Getting no, away from I, the word too. Into um, into the medieval times. Um, there are so many great stories to tell about France that have not been told because 
because the French tell stories differently than the English or the in the, in the English language. Okay, the English, the British write historical fiction about the Tudors. Yep. And on and on and on. And the Americans read that and they love it. Fine. But the French were so fascinating in that period. And so I'd like to get into that. We'll see. I, I've written one and I'd like to make it a series and we'll see if... Um, I can find a publisher. Well, that's, that's the always, always a trick, isn't it? But you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm all for um, English reading people getting more access to a French point of view, even it's if it goes through the deviation of an Ellen Hampton, someone right. living in, because it's. It, 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 I'm always saying it's such a shame that, uh, uh, that I, I can read French slowly, and it takes me long, and I have to look up words. I don't, and it, I don't have, I don't have, I don't enjoy reading in French, like when I'm reading a good you know, James Holland or John, but I can. And there are so many books I put down. I've got If I wish that was available in English. I mean, there's some great books about the occupation of Normandy, great books about the liberation of the front, great books about just the experience of living through it that never get translated. And, and conversely, of course, so many good English language books about aspects don't end up in French. So the French can't read them. And you, you go into museums in Normandy and there's the book we've always, I'm always saying this, there's the books by the British and American authors in English for their, for their readers. And there's the books in French for their readers. It's like, what, why is there not more cross-pollination of this? Because I think most people watching this who are D-Day experts, D-Day, but they have not read a book on Normandy by a French author. And it's like, but, but that's where it happened. How can you get get any idea of how that action unfolded without understanding people read about the german side the british side american side um the only person i can think of whose books get translated is giles milton the brit whose whose wife is french and spent half his year in burgundy so his books are relevant french but he's he's not french he's nearly french but you know it, I, I wish i wish there was much more uh, uh, overlap but anyway yeah 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 that's another subject. But anyway, it's been great talking to you, Ellen. I great can't wait to meet you again. Thank you and again. Um, folks, I will hold up the book again. So there, there are links below and you can find it anywhere. And it's a it's a it's a good read. So um we'll 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 bring you in bring you back for something else. Uh, if I ever do a medieval TV show, I'll invite you back. <laughs> yeah, or you might, you never know. Come. You never know. But brilliant. Yeah. So folks, I've got a show on Sunday about um Kokoda Plata. I'm really pleased to have the Australian author David W. Cameron. I'm emphasizing the David W. Cameron, not David Cameron, the politician. I wouldn't have him on World War II TV, but that's fantastic. No one knows more about the Kokoda uh, campaign than David, so I'm really looking forward to that. Well, then I've got a break for a few days. So, folks, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the donations that came in. Thank you very much for buying the T-shirts available. If you haven't found our um, Let's Go Down a Rabbit Hole on World War II TV T-shirt, the links are available below. So thank you, Ellen. Thank you, viewers. I will see you all on Sunday. Cheers, everybody. Bye. <laughs>